I would like to welcome you to part 8 of this 10-part online training program on adaptive designs and clinical trial simulation. We will talk again about adaptive designs with treatment selection. We had, a good, we had a good review of statistical methods used in this class of trial designs uh, back in part 7. And the next step will be to introduce software tools that facilitate the process of designing these complex adaptive trials. Let me once again say a few words about the role of software tools in the context of designing adaptive trials. And um, I guess in the general context of this online training program, when it comes to most traditional designs without any data-driven rules, any data-driven elements, we know that closed form solutions are commonly available to perform sample size and power calculations. But what we need to remember is that with adaptive designs, there are no closed form solutions when it comes to sample size calculations. Uh, to be able to compute the required number of patients or required number of events in an adaptive trial, it typically takes careful planning, careful evaluation, uh, those uh, considerations play a central role in um, the general setting of adaptive trials. There are clearly more design parameters to account for in adaptive trials compared to traditional trials. And this is exactly where efficient software tools for clinical trial simulation become indispensable. And this is where the Mediana Designer package comes in, as well as potentially other software tools for designing adaptive trials. And as shown on the slide, you can uh, easily download and install the Mediana Designer package by following the uh, link to the CRAN website. We have provided a lot of additional information and documentation including a description of statistical methods and technical manuals on our website at mediana.us. And uh, as I've said several times before, we have prepared a comprehensive online manual that includes multiple useful case studies. You can find those on the GitHub website. Again, if you follow the link shown at the bottom of the slide. I would like to point out again that the software tools I'm describing in this online training program could be run locally on your computer or alternatively you could also run them in the cloud and uh, the information shown on the slide the uh, address the login and the password would allow you to access those web applications those applications feature a graphical user interface and you can run simulations to help you design appropriate adaptive trials without having to install any software on your computer. So let's take a look at adaptive designs with treatment selection in phase three or confirmatory trials that are supported by the Mediana Designer package. This package comes with a function called ADTREAT selection that enables efficient simulation-based design of trials with data-driven treatment selection. In addition to that, you can also launch a web type interface, a graphical user interface uh, on your computer as opposed to a web application in the cloud. And this web application would have the same useful, easy to use uh, graphical user interface that uh, would facilitate the process of specifying the parameters for designing adaptive phase three trials that support treatment selection, and additional technical information about the underlying statistical methodology, certain conventions that we used for this class of adaptive trials could be found in the technical manual that you can download if you follow the link shown at the bottom of this slide. And we're now ready to take a look at the case study. It's a case study labeled B1. This is the case study that we used in part seven to motivate, to illustrate an adaptive approach to treatment selection in multi-stage clinical trials. I will go over key elements of this case study before I introduce the function that I mentioned a minute ago, the ADTREAT cell function from the Mediana Designer package. 
and I will show you how this three-stage adaptive design with futility and treatment selection can be designed using this function. What you see on this slide, as well as the next slide, is a quick summary of the key features of this case study that we introduced in detail back in part 7. Uh, this case study relies on a phase 3 uh, trial. This was a real-life phase 3 trial that utilized an adaptive approach. This was a trial conducted in infants uh, with uh, hemangiomas. This trial employed a multi-arm design. One of the arms was a placebo arm. In addition to that, there were four arms that represented four dosing regimens of the investigational therapy. And here, if I could maybe step back and um, talk a little bit about the fact that adaptive treatment selection designs are very commonly used in the so-called phase two, phase three setting. And um, the key idea there is to review the dose response information at an interim look that corresponds to the end of the phase two stage of the trial and then identify the best doses that will be examined at the final analysis that corresponds then to the end of the phase three portion, portion of the trial. And in this case, treatment selection was not applied to dose levels, but rather to dosing regimens. So once again, four regimens of the investigational treatment, which was propranolol, were uh, defined, and they were defined as different dose levels of propranolol, and the treatment duration also varied, so a combination of those two factors gives us four different dosing regimens, and those dosing regimens would be compared to placebo. The primary endpoint in this trial is a binary endpoint. It represents the rate of complete or nearly complete resolution of the target hemangioma. And this assessment will be made fairly late in the study. Uh, the length of the treatment period, as you see on the slide, is six months. For this adaptive design, just like for the other two classes of adaptive designs, with uh, sample size reestimation and population selection, a three-stage design will be employed, which means that there will be three decision points. So there will be two interim analyses followed by the final analysis. At the first decision point, at the first interim analysis, a futility stopping rule will be predefined, and this rule will be applied to, to each individual dosing regimen of this uh, new investigational treatment. This rule will be defined using conditional power. This is a standard approach to setting up utility stopping rules. And if conditional power for a particular regimen, when we compare it to placebo, if this conditional power is very low, then this regimen will be dropped or discontinued for futility in the sense that patients will no longer be enrolled in this trial arm in the future after the first interim analysis. And of course, if all regimens are dropped at this decision point, then the trial will have to be terminated for futility. The second interim analysis will support treatment selection among those regimens that were retained at the first interim. And we will assume here that the trial sponsor is interested in identifying the best treatment regimen for the final assessment. I would like to point out that the software implementation of this class of adaptive designs that support treatment selection is actually quite flexible and any number, any predefined number of regimens or doses could be selected for the second interim assessment. It is simply a parameter in the function that supports adaptive treatment selection designs. And the final decision point, of course, would be the final analysis. And at that point, the selected most promising dosing regimen will be compared to placebo with appropriate statistical adjustments, including an adjustment for multiplicity. So we're now ready to begin reviewing the code and the parameters required by the function for adaptive treatment selection designs. The very first step, the very first thing that we need to do is to load the Mediana Designer package. This step is not explicitly shown on the slide. And after that, we need to initialize the list of functions parameters, as you see at the top of the slide. And then the arguments of this uh, parameter list will be populated. The first argument is the endpoint type. As I explained a minute ago, 
The primary efficacy endpoint in this uh, case study is binary, and therefore the endpoint type parameter is set to the keyword binary. This primary efficacy endpoint is defined in, term, in terms of the response rate. So the sponsor is planning to show that uh, the individual, the best dosing regimen of the investigational therapy results in a higher response rate compared to placebo. For this reason, the direction of favorable outcome, this parameter is set to the keyword higher. The last uh, parameter shown on the slide uh, gives us the number of enrolled patients for the five trial arms in the trial. Since there are five trial arms, we need to specify a vector with five elements. In this case, a balanced design is assumed in this case study, and uh, specifically, nine patients per trial arm are expected to be enrolled in the trial. This slide defines the set of treatment effect assumptions for the primary efficacy endpoint, which is binary. And therefore, uh, instead of specifying, for example, the means or standard deviations of the underlying normal distribution, all we have to do here is to specify the response rates. The assumed response rate in the control or placebo arm is 10% and the response rates for the four dosing regimens are shown in this vector with four elements. We assume that the first two regimens, I uh, will label them regimen, regimens one and two, provide a slightly lower response rate of about 30%, and the uh, reg regimens three and four are expected to result in a slightly higher response rate of 35% each. This slide uh, defines uh, key parameters of the interim analysis, interim analysis one and two, as well as the as well as the final analysis. We're going to begin with the specification for the information fractions. The information fractions are specified using the parameter uh, called info frac. Uh, it requires uh, three elements. It's a vector with three elements because there are three decision points in this trial. We can see here that the information fractions or the fractions of patients at each interim look compared to the total sample size are set to 20%. This is a fairly low information fraction, so that corresponds to fairly early futility assessment at the first interim analysis. Then treatment selection will be performed uh, at uh, the information fraction of about of 50%. So that's the point uh, where 50% of the patients are expected to complete the six-month a treatment period and the information fraction for the final analysis is simply set to one. All of the patients will be enrolled in the study and they will contribute to the final assessment. When it comes to the parameters of the individual decision rules at the first and uh, second interim analysis, they are shown on this slide as well as the uh, next several slides, uh, beginning with the futility assessment. The futility uh, threshold for conditional power is set to 0.3 or 30%, which means that when we compare, uh, perform a futility assessment, we assess the potential for lack of efficacy for each dosing regimen compared to placebo. If conditional power for that particular comparison, let's say the very first dosing regimen versus placebo, if conditional power for that particular comparison is below the 30% mark, then a decision would be made to discontinue patient enrollment in that particular trial arm. And we will also provide information here about the anticipated patient dropout or discontinuation rate at the end of the uh, six-month treatment period. And that dropout rate is expected to be 15% or 0.15%. The next set of parameters is related to the treatment selection rule. As I uh, emphasized a few slides back, uh, the software tool is quite flexible and that uh, would enable the trial sponsor to predefine any number of uh, the best doses or regimens to be selected at the second interim analysis. In this case, as we said, the sponsor is interested in identifying the single best dosing regimen that will be compared to placebo at the final analysis and therefore the treatment count parameter here will be set to one. And of course, a very important consideration that arises every time we perform data-driven assessments or apply data-driven decision rules 
is the potential to inflate the type one error rate or alpha to be able to control the alpha in uh, an adaptive trial it is very common to predefine a, a multiple testing procedure or a multiplicity correction in this case a multiplicity adjustment in this trial will be uh, performed using the Hogberg test. This is the last slide. There are only two more parameters to specify, and these are fairly standard parameters for any type of a clinical trial simulation assessment. Of course, it will be very important. It will be critical to specify the overall type 1 error rate or the alpha level. In this case, it is set to 0 0.0 to 5 or 2.5% a required alpha level for all phase 3 or confirmatory trials and then power calculations uh, will be performed using 10,000 simulation runs. Now that we're done with these specifications we can now uh, grab the list of parameters and we can uh, pass it on to the AD treat select function. Uh, this function will run the simulations. Um, it is um, just like any other function including the Mediana designer package relies on a very efficient simulation engine written in C++. I would expect that it would take just a few seconds to run, to go through 10,000 simulation runs and then produce the results. Those uh, simulation results will be saved along with all of the required parameters to the object that is called results. And now we're going to pass this uh, object to the generate report function and it will generate a simulation report and we'll save it. It will be a Word document. We'll save it uh, to uh, the file name uh, case study b one dot docx This R code as well as the simulation report generated by the AD tree itself function are available. If you can be easily downloaded, uh, you can inspect the code, you can modify the code if you would like to. Uh, if you follow the um, link shown on the slide. And now we're ready to go over the simulation report for this case study. Uh, we will review most important characteristics of the proposed adaptive design that supports fertility and treatment selection rules. The simulation report is a Word document. It includes a summary of the parameters and all of the assumptions for this adaptive design. Those parameters can be found in the first eight tables, tables one through eight. In addition to that, you will find four tables on the last page of the report. Those tables present key characteristics of the decision rules that were applied at the first and the second interim analysis. And you also find the comparison based on benchmarks for this adaptive design. I will present those tables, the most important simulation findings, on the next three slides. The first of those tables, uh, table 9, provides a useful summary of the characteristics of the decision rule that was applied at the first interim analysis. It's a futility stopping rule. This table gives us the probabilities of dropping each individual regimen due to futility. And we can see here that this probability ranges from about 22 or 23 percent for the first two regimens, one and two, and it, uh, it's going, it is expected to drop to about 14 to 15 percent for regimens uh, three and four. We can see here clearly that this futility stopping rule does what it's supposed to do because there's a higher chance of discontinuing the first two regimens at the syndrome analysis, since, as you remember, we assumed a relatively low response rate for those two regimens compared to regimens three and four. If you remember, the common response rate for the first two regimens was 30%, as opposed to the common response rate of 35% for regimens uh, three and four. And um, it's here also important to note that the probability of terminating the entire trial for fidelity is quite low. This quantity is shown in the very last row, in the bottom row of this uh, table. We can see that this probability of terminating the trial for fidelity is less than 2%. The main characteristics of the decision rule at the second interim analysis are listed in, in this table, uh, which is a table 10 from the simulation report. In this case, for each regimen, 
Table 10 shows the probability that this regimen will be identified as the best, as the most promising regimen based on the cumulative efficacy data up to this uh, decision point, up to the second interim analysis. And if, as, as you remember, uh, the goal here is to identify the single best regimen for the final assessment. And we can see here clearly from this table that the more effective regimens, that are regimens three and four, are much more likely to be chosen for the final analysis compared to regimens one and two. We're comparing, we're talking here about the probability of about 38% of being selected versus the probability of about 15 to 16% uh, the selection probabilities. And the last row in this table presents the same quantity as table nine on the, that we looked at uh, just a minute ago. It is simply the probability that no regimen will be chosen at this decision point, And it is simply the probability of stopping the trial for futility at the first interim analysis. The last two tables from the simulation report, these are tables 11 and 12, are combined on a slide to make it easier for us to compare the performance of the traditional and adaptive designs for this case study. In this case, uh, we are defining several traditional designs. These are two arm designs. Each individual regimen is compared to placebo. They serve as a benchmark for the proposed adaptive design. We said back in part seven that if we have the benefit of hindsight, it would have been ideal to simply design a two-arm trial where the best dose or the most promising dosing regimen for this investigational therapy of interest would be compared versus placebo at the final analysis. But of course, at the design stage, we simply do not have this information. We're not completely sure which dose, which dosing regimen would be the best one. And this is why we have to go through all this trouble, if you will, uh, with a multi-stage design that employs decisions that um, facilitate the process of identifying the best, most promising treatment for the final assessment. So the uh, conclusion here is that the adaptive design, and we see the probability of success for the, for the adaptive design in the bottom row, it's uh, 92%. So the adaptive design clearly provides a significant power advantage over each traditional design. If we now compare the bottom row in this table to the first four row, we see that for those traditional to arm designs, the probability of success ranges between 71.4% up to 84.3%. And uh, here I'd like to point out that the last two rows, uh, uh, rows uh, three and four here, those two traditional designs correspond to the comparisons of the more effective regimens, uh, three and four. And um, I guess they come reasonably close to the adaptive design, but still there's a, a gain of about eight percentage points here. I com I'm comparing 84% versus 92% uh, for the adaptive design, which means that the adaptive approach improves the probability of success in the trial by about eight percentage points. And here we also need to keep in mind that in the adaptive design, the predefined multiplicity correction based on the Hogwarts test is applied. And by contrast, there are no multiplicity penalties for the traditional designs because there a single regimen is compared to placebo. There is no need to worry about multiplicity in that case. We're now done with part eight and we're done with adaptive designs uh, that support data-driven treatment selection. There's only one topic left in this training program. It is the class of multi-population designs that would enable data-driven population selection rules based on interim efficacy data. This topic will be covered in the last two videos in parts nine and 10. And uh, as I've done before, I would like to thank you for your interest in this online training course and would like to encourage you to watch the other videos in this uh, program and share information on this online training program with your colleagues.